So hi, Amy, and thank you so much for spending the time to talk to us today about your research. A lot of people who will be watching this uh, interview will know you for your enormous contribution to the World Federation of Music Therapy as well as in North America. But today we're really going to focus on you as a researcher. So could you start off maybe by telling us a little bit about your research experience? Sure. So at present, I am the assistant professor at the Music and Health Research Collaboratory at the University of Toronto. I'm also teaching as an instructor in the master's and undergraduate music therapy program at Wilfrid Laurier, mm -hmm. um, but still involved in clinical work. So I think for me, um, being a researcher, it's really important to be involved in clinical work because I find that my research questions, the best ones that I have, really come from my clinical work and me wanting to gain a better understanding of why things are happening um, and phenomenon. So that's, um, I get really inspired by my clinical work and so many questions that I would love to research um, come to mind. So um, I never thought I would be a researcher, you know, when I did my undergrad degree and, and started as a music therapist. I, you know, my goal was to to help people and to use my, my music and um, I got really excited about research and I hope that you will as well. Oh great, so tell us a little bit about your clinical context so we know how your research fits in. Sure, so I do have experience working with people across the lifespan um, but I would say that my focus um, of, of working with clients really has been with older adults diagnosed with dementia or other cognitive impairments as well as palliative care. So I spent many years um, doing research there. More recently, um, I've expanded my practice with neurologic music therapy training, as well as um, uh, guided imagery and music. So I've, I've started working with different populations there, um, as well younger, uh, younger uh, people um, suffering from various traumas. Um, so thinking maybe down the line that will be some of my research but um, to date a large amount of my research has been done with um, palliative care and uh, with persons um, that have dementia. Okay all right well let's focus in on that for now but it's really important to note that you know our careers change over our lives and that it's exciting and dynamic to be moving to new fields and, and taking on new training that I think that's inspirational. Uh, but so within palliative care for example what kinds of research methodologies have you favoured? Well, um, you know, when I began, it's an interesting question. When I began in palliative care, um, I was invited, um, you know, to be part of the interdisciplinary team. And the team was very concerned about pain. Um, obviously, that's one of the biggest issues in palliative care. And it's, it's essential that a client's physical pain is controlled before they can really be pursuing any kinds of other um, spiritual, psychological um, goals or issues that they may have. So my first study, which kind of went against what I, what I maybe desired, but was seemed to be the push from the team, was to do a quantitative study. And that looked at um, how music, was music helpful in terms of reducing pain perception and enhancing physical comfort. And it was a combination of, um, or a comparison rather, of live music versus recorded music. Um, and you got me as your musician. Um, so it spanned over two years and I had excellent statistically significant results showing that both live and recorded music um, were effective at reducing pain perception, um, with live music being that much more um, significant or beneficial. But from the study, I didn't learn anything new. I already knew that music helped here, that music helps people with pain perception. And so that changed me um, into more of a mixed methods researcher. Um, so from that point, um, I guess uh, one of the bigger studies that I've done, or the one, one of the ones that touches me the most probably is my doctoral work. Um, so here I investigated um, relationship completion at end of life. And um, essentially I wanted to understand the experience of four dying persons um, as they navigated um, this process um, of being terminally ill and specifically looking at relationship completion. So that led to um, also a cross-case analysis of the 
four participants. And we saw the emergence of global themes, which included things like love, loss, gratitude, um, thank you, goodbye. Um, I was privy to witness how much growth and transformation could come at end of life. So from this study, I learned a lot about um, being a music therapist and about which techniques um, were the most beneficial to clients. I learned about a concept um, that really isn't discussed a lot, relationship completion. Um, and no one really had been terming what they were doing at end of life um, in music therapy as relationship completion. But essentially, when I looked at the literature, there were examples of it happening already. Um, and so this kind of just formalized it um, and studied that concept. Um, and looking at the significance of music and being able to help someone express goodbye, I love you, thank you, forgive me, and I forgive you. Um, and so there was a lot of songwriting that took part um, as part of those case studies. Um, and really, it was a, a very in-depth study that um, I recorded um, all of the music therapy sessions and, and then I transcribed them all. And each client probably had about 35 sessions. So it was a significant amount of data and a significant learning um, curve for me as well to, you know, to have a session with a client, uh, you know, for an hour, perhaps even 90 minutes, and then to go and transcribe that later in the evening, which would take three to four hours. But then I had this rich data, all of this rich data with direct quotes from all of the participants, which then went into the case studies. And I also was a little bit radical, um, and I decided that I was going to write narrative case studies because I wanted these persons' voices heard. And so there are uh, half of the case studies really are direct quotes from the participants. So you, you hear them introducing themselves, and you hear how their process was. In music therapy gosh that sounds so beautiful and so I can hear this pull between politically useful uh, research which meets the need of other people such as your team because they wanted to make sure what you were doing helped and and providing evidence for the profession and then this other side of researching which is about you learning I think you you say that so beautifully that it's one thing to provide evidence for those outside of us and it's a different thing to learn something for ourselves. And as therapists, you know, I guess it's no surprise that beautiful themes about love and relationship completion are really powerful for you to discover uh, as well, I'm sure, as the beautiful work that you did. So I guess what I'd like to point out is that even in a medical model, which palliative care sits in, although a bit to the side, you know, there is space for both of these approaches and both of them has such important value to offer, but that we can see them quite differently and make conscious choices about which one we choose. Mm -hmm. mm, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So tell us then about, uh, you know, I'm sure you've gone on to do a lot more, but that's already extremely interesting. Um, so tell us about how that, that, uh, the two different styles of quantitative and qualitative as we've often called them in music therapy how does that sit in your part of the world in Canada and North America you know is everybody doing mixed method studies now is there a lot of diversity or is there a push in, in either direction I think you know until the 1980s there was it seemed that there was a lot more quantitative research that was being done or at least that was what was being published um, and certainly uh, I think I would say in the last 15 years there's quite a, a trend towards you know the inclusion of much more qualitative research um, and I think people um, are also more aware of um, the techniques to analyze quality qualitative research and so the level and quality of the research has improved that much and so it is becoming more accepted um, as more people understand that it's that there are actually techniques that we use to code etc and analyze qualitative data um, so for me I think um, I think there is there is there is there is both right now there is still you know a lot of people that are solely quantitative here there's a lot of that are qualitative, um, and then there are people that are doing mixed methods. Um, 
and I know there is there are some people that don't believe in combining methodologies but really as you pointed out when you summed up um, my you know my earlier point um, about learning um, I think it not only do I learn from the qualitative but I think our field learns right um, we learn about the techniques um, that are working that aren't working and that makes us better you know makes us better practitioners um, so definitely I think it is more accepted um, but still um, you know I go to present uh, at various conferences I don't just like to speak um, at music therapy events I like to go to other allied health care uh, conferences and try to publish in other allied health care um, journals because I think it's important that we disseminate our knowledge um, you know, uh, b more broadly. Um, and so, yeah, there is pushback at times that I see, you know, people wanting more quantitative, but I do see that there is more acceptance of qualitative. And, you know, we're so lucky with music because music um, touches people and makes them feel. And so I feel blessed. It's almost like I have this little tool, you know, that I can pull out when I go to presentations, when I, they can see a video clip of my clients or hear a song someone has written in. I can move them. Mm, I know. I often wonder how all those other people survive out there in the world uh -huh. <laughs> without the beautiful blessings that we have from music to light up a presentation and to build our relationships around. I, I really, I do wonder. All mm -hmm. right. And so you're saying that, yes, there is still an emphasis in medical context for evidence and for quantitative data and we've talked about the fact that that's okay. So is that just in America and North America or do you think that's around the world when you read the literature from Europe and South America and Asia? Mm. You know, does there seem to be the same kinds of uh, focuses? I do think that, um, that it's not unique to, to North America at all, that there is still... Um, you know, quite a big focus from medical profession um, on quantitative. But I do think music therapists are much more open to qualitative. I do think um, a lot of the, you know, other allied healthcare professions are also open to it and it's growing. Um, I do see uh, one trend, um, which I'm actually pretty excited about, is that there is more collaborative research. So, um, you know, teams working together with a variety of specialists and I do think that's uh, a move forward for sure um, by including people that have the various skills um, to inform the study. Um, so I do believe that that is a, a growing trend in healthcare and a, and a good one. So. Yeah, and it really allows for that kind of mixed methods approach too because, it, you know, it can be so hard to be an expert in both approaches and it takes twice as much time. So whilst mixed method sounds like a perfect solution and in some ways I think it is, it really is also helpful to be able to do that kind of thing in collaboration. So you can have your statistical expert and you can have your qualitative analysis expert and your clinician and your medico and 